So my name is Matt Ross. I run the Artificial Intelligence Research and Development Lab here at the Municipal Government in London, Ontario, Canada. So it's a, a lab where we try to build, procure, and deploy high-valued AI applications for municipal government, um, and when appropriate, uh, open source those uh, in-house built models to other cities um, in Canada and, and, around, and around the world. So I'm going to walk you through a deep learning model we just launched in late August out of our lab. So it aimed to tackle the problem of chronic homelessness uh, here in our city. Um, this was utilizing tabular data. I think that was you know the initial uh, title of my presentation here. So we have a bunch of tabular data um, from our homeless shelter information management system, uh, which we use to make our predictions. So I'll walk you through some context, kind of a general overview, dig into some of the interesting aspects of our pre-processing pipeline, our model architecture, um, custom loss function, and uh, something we call our predictive horizon, and then uh, finish off with some interpretable AI using Lime. So walk you through a bit of the context of chronic homelessness in London. Um, the business case behind the model, that kind of thing. So homelessness has become a pretty critical issue in London. Shelters are over capacity. It's leading, you know, to lower risk homelessness becoming higher risk because, you know, there there aren't the shelter capacities there. So someone who would have usually addressed things on their own uh, becomes a high risk homelessness. There's also a vicious cycle we see in the data. So the longer you stay in a shelter system, the higher the probability is you will continue to stay in it. This is largely due to compounding trauma and some other things uh, experienced well in the shelter system. Um, then there's a big cost. So this is where the, the kind of business case comes in. Um, a chronically homeless individual, according to a Calgary study, costs the city $135,000 per year. Um, and so for the purposes of defining our ground truth of our model, um, a chronically homeless individual is someone who has spent 180 days or more in our shelter system per year. Um, so you can think of this as like a, a rolling count with a window looking back a year in the data set. Um, then there's, uh, and this is really big for the business case, um, and just kind of why this is high value and really needed, is there's a huge shelter resource consumption disparity. So if you look at average times in shelters, a chronically homeless individual uses on average 534 days, shelter days of the system in their entire time on average. Um, and someone who never will become chronically homeless, so will never cross that 180 day threshold, um, they use on average 45 shelter days. So it's like a wild, wild disparity in the data. Um, a chronically homeless individual utilizes on average 12 times the resources of a lower risk client. And though they represent four to five percent of the clients in the shelter system, they consume 25.8 percent of our resources. Um, and when you consider 80 percent of individuals on average, um, they address their homelessness within a month or two. This is a huge shelter bottleneck and kind of resource capacity issue. It's also worth noting the data, you know, garbage in, uh, garbage out of data science. Um, this kind of thing isn't possible without pretty strong data governance foundation um, that really enabled this project. So this this data set is a merger of over 20 homeless serving organizations under one database schema. Ton of effort in like standards of practice of data collection, data governance, data hygiene, and, and getting at high quality data in there, which is kind of the the key first step for any machine learning uh, in the first place. So. The hypothesis is this CHI model, uh, it's our chronic homelessness AI model, would enable proactive resource prioritization to decrease chronic homelessness in our city. So if we could predict future chronic homelessness, then we can prioritize resources earlier to decrease chronic homelessness. So that was kind of the hypothesis going into it. So the model we built, um, the CHI model, it predicts the probability of chronic homelessness six months into the future for all consenting clients in the shelter system. So it's integrated into our HIFAS application, which is our like our homeless inflammation management system, kind of like a CRM. Um, and predictions are then delivered through like an in-app report to caseworkers. Um, the model architecture, it was this uh, unique hybrid of a recurrent neural network and then a fully connected multi-layer perceptron neural network. It also, the model also employs explainable AI, allows the machine learning model to kind of explain why it is making the predictions it is. Um, and this really enables us to you know, build trust in the model, eliminate unintended bias, uh, helps in feature engineering as well. We've also built this for open source. It is open source now on our GitHub. Um, it's well-documented, modular, extensible. The idea is what we try to build in the lab is things that are turnkey. You know, there's um, several dozen users of this exact same database schema, other municipalities in Canada. So we wanted to build something that is you know, well-documented for us, but then also anyone who uses the same database can just pretty turnkey train up their own model. Um, and then some quick results and performance metrics. 
Um, 7,100 active clients in London Shelter System. Our model now, it's been in production since August. Um, at uh, August 30th, I think it was, it was predicting 88 individuals who would become newly chronically homeless. We know who those 88 individuals are and our shelter system, you know, it's working how to best prioritize resources to those individuals. Um, and it's worth noting since we're talking about predictions, this, so this is a production system. It runs inference daily rather than like on demand through like a REST API endpoint or something like that. Um, and we monitor the performance metrics constantly and then do annual retraining um, just to kind of keep the, the data fresh in the model. And the performance metrics we were able to achieve, this is our production performance metrics, is 92.1% recall, 65.1% precision, and recall was the most most important uh, performance metrics from a, like a business value perspective. And, and the business here is our, our homeless prevention division. They thought recall was mo you know, more important than precision, AUC, accuracy, accuracy, of course, because there's class imbalance. So I want to dig in um, to the data pre-processing pipeline. So the final model we deployed, we concatenate static features with dynamic features. So it's a methodology that's more commonly found in data science applications where you're like processing customer transaction history, where there's both static and dynamic features. Um, you know, static features are things like, in our case, client demographic attributes, you know, age, gender, Aboriginal status, veteran status, health conditions, large life events, income, et cetera. Um, so there are about 300 of these static features after pre-processing. Um, and that's because largely these features are, you know, multi-layer or multi-valued um, categorical features, which after pre-processing, they just turn into sparse um, one hot encoded matrices, just like a Boolean matrix. Um, and then the, so that's the static features. Then the dynamic features are monthly counts of various service use, uh, usages by the client. So a service could be a particular shelter stay, storage days, housing support, et cetera. Um, we took this from this kind of model hybrid architecture from, uh, you know, kind of customer transaction history, um, you know, in like credit card risk models, things like that. There is static demographic data, then there is transaction history. And so that is that is how we, uh, we kind of took inspiration to build this. Um, so then with those dynamic features, we generate these counts for six months going back for the client. So number of shelter stays this month, last month, two, three months ago, four months ago, et cetera. And then those dynamic features are concatenated to the static. And the intuition on like why we pursued this kind of feature engineering and day pre-processing at all was this gives the model a better sense for service usage pattern evolution of an individual client. So, um, you know, is a individual addressing their homelessness on their own, which is actually very common over 80% of cases, or alternatively, is this individual on a trajectory to becoming chronically homeless? And that's something which is, it's really impossible to infer from just aggregate current counts of services. Um, it's really obscured, uh, it obscures the trajectory. And I only mention this because it really wildly improved our performance metrics when we changed our pre-processing this way. Um, our second iteration of the model used only the static features, um, you know, those client attributes, demographic features. And then our version three model, our final production model had those dynamic features. And between the two models, we saw a doubling of our precision metrics um, there's a 50% reduction in false positive, which is like very critical from a business perspective when you're talking about actually providing individuals with social service resources where, you know, false positives have a significant dollar value and labor costs to them. So digging into model architecture, um, the final architecture we deployed was, as I mentioned, it's a recurrent neural network um, with a fully connected multi-layer perceptron neural network. So we, this bumped up our performance a few points, so we kept it. Um, my heuristic as to why is that the RNM better captured the time series evolution um, and dependencies of, of chronic homelessness. Um, essentially, this hybrid architecture takes those dynamic features of the data, things like shelter stays last month, two months ago, three months ago, et cetera. Um, we feed that through a long short-term memory unit, LSTM layer, um, and in, se in a sequence of six time steps. So in our case, our time steps are months, so six months. Some clients we have up to you know three four years of data, so we feed that all in in sequence uh, through the LSTM layer. Then we concatenate the learn parameters of the LSTM to the static data, um, which are again those demographic attributes of the client, and then feed the full thing through the fully connected feed forward uh, multi layer perceptron neural network. Um, and then just some common regularization techniques. You know you have dropout between each layer, and then it terminates in a single sigmoid unit. So this is. It's a deep learning architecture, though, like admittedly a fairly shallow one. 
um, and it's framed as a binary classification problem, which I'll talk a little bit about more in a second. Um, but as you can see on the left, um, we settled upon the, those hyperparameters after a pretty broad hyperparameter search. Um, you can actually see it's like a pretty small LSTM layer, like only, I think it's four, yeah, that's like four units, um, but we got a few percentile uh, bump in our performance metrics, so we kept it, even though it's a little kind of uh, hybrid architecture, but it's also worth saying we did benchmark um, these architectures against standard models like logistic regression, random forest, um, and though those models came close, or at least logis logistic regression came closer, um, our architecture still performed best for what we actually cared about from a business perspective. And so anyone who wants to dig in, there is a archive preprint up while our paper's under review. Um, you're welcome to check that out as well. So two other notable things um, about our model was, so the, the context here is the business, which is our homeless prevention division. We were kind of co-building co this together. They determined that recall was more important than precision, right? Um, so with precision being a close second in importance. So to accommodate this business logic, we did two things. First, we used the F1 score metric as our primary metric to evaluate success of the model. Um, you know, that was the, the primary metric that would determine what goes into production. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, this balance is both kind of precision recall, ensuring like a balanced minimization of false positives and false negatives. Um, but then second, we implemented a custom weighted F1 loss function. This was largely inspired by the F beta score. Um, and, you know, we actually incorporated this obviously in the training itself as a loss function. So you can see the equation uh, below on the slide. You can see there's some two weighting parameters. And this actually enabled us to define within the structure of the loss function, how much we actually cared, how much more we cared about recall than precision. Um, and I think we settled on and we cared about it 4.5 times more. Um, and we found this weighted F1 loss, it provided way more stable results um, for model performance for the metrics we cared about, recall and precision and F1 score. Um, and you know, this is strange. You'd usually expect a classification model like this would have something like a binary cross entropy. Um, and we initially were using that. We just found that the models we were getting, they're really noisy in the final recall and precision. Um, so weren't really ideal for training a stable production pipeline. So we settled on this. All right, so the whole presentation, I have been saying uh, this model predicts chronic homelessness six months into the future. So we framed this as a binary classification problem where we hid the most recent six months of data from the model and then made predictions uh, on the future values of the remaining data you know, prior to those hidden six months. So we call this parameter the predictive horizon of the model. Um, and in development of the predictive horizon, we parameterized the length of that time horizon um, in which we were predicting and then scanned between you know, zero weeks and all the way to predicting 52 weeks into the future. Um, so we found, as you probably expect, an inverse relationship between model performance metrics and predictive horizon. That is, the longer into the future you are trying to predict a client's state of homelessness, um, the more inaccurate those predictions become. So homeless prevention settled on six months as their, their sweet spot for, you know, decaying performance metrics on the one hand and still enabling a significant length of predictive horizon on the other. Um, but realistically, this, you know, I think this is one of those things that as they dig in, we're in two months now into implementation, um, you know, as they continue to work through that, they may wish to augment that predictive horizon as they get more data on outcomes, decisions are made, resources are prioritized and the cost of that. Um, you know, it might be, they might decide that maybe it's worth bearing the the cost of deploying more resources on additional false positives just because, you know, they get that many more true positives in the business cases there. Um, but that, you know, that's something that will be seen and adjusted over time. So finally, um, wanted to dig into the interpretability. So I mentioned that this model employs explainability or interpretability. Um, as you all know, um, learning machine learning architectures such as ours would usually be considered a black box. And um, as the model, it, it tells you a prediction, it gives you a prediction, um, but can't tell you why it made it. So this of course, isn't really uh, acceptable for a machine learning model, which will be used to aid in distribution of social service resources. Um, as a government institution, we have a, a responsibility to be transparent and accountable. So uh, to combat this problem, we use LIME, which stands for local, inter uh, local interpretable model agnostic explanations. Um, so this enables you to unpack um, why the machine learning model is doing what it's doing. And the way it works at kind of a high level is 
imagine this graph below um, on the slide is a representation of those who are chronically homeless in red um, and those who are not in blue. And you can see the nonlinear decision boundary uh, bordering the red blue polygons. Um, but then Lyme posits that if you zoom into just a particular example, say a particular client, and we'll say that that red bolded cross there, um, then the decision boundary, once you zoom into that small neighborhood, actually acts linearly. Um, you know, like how our, our spherical Earth looks flat from our small individual perspective, um, but it is still spherical, just to be clear, the Earth is not flat. Um, so the image here, um, if you look at that bolded red cross, um, assume that that is an individual who is chronically homeless, Lime then perturbs the data around that example or generates a bunch of kind of representative data points um, around that single exa example. And then you can actually fit a linear model to separate your classes and make your predictions. And then linear models are inherently interpretable. So just by, you know, like pulling the feature coefficients. Um, and so that enables us to get our black box model to provide explanations to which features are correlated to chronic homelessness for a particular individual. Or um, you can also do a global surrogate and see, you know, what are the, uh, the correlating features to chronic homelessness across the entire data set? So very useful, whether it's the individual level or the, the kind of full London population level. Um, and then the output from Lyme is shown on the right here. So this is a redacted report a caseworker can see uh, for a particular individual in our shelter system. Um, you know, given the risk probability of chronic homelessness uh, six months from the prediction date, and then various features that are correlated or not um, with chronic homelessness. This isn't all the features. These are just the, the main contributory ones. Um, and, you know, this really helps build trust that the model predictions are reasonable and can be trusted and tailored to, you know, the demographic and service users data of a single client. Um, and then, it, you know, it really assists the caseworker in explaining why the model makes the predictions it does, building that trust, super important, ensuring there is an unintended bias. Um, and though, it, we don't have time to talk about it here, uh, of course, but like there is a lot going on with this model around like ethical AI development practices, information security, privacy, consent, um, that actually allow a very sensitive model like this to be live in production. Um, so, you know, of course, happy to answer any questions about that, but definitely know there is a, a lot going on from the, the kind of governance and security and privacy side on this. Um, and just to finally end here, like I, I see this as really important in, you know, in government in general, like often uh, governments implementing AI in hopes of, you know, being deploying AI ethically and transparently, they use inherently interpretable models and methods, uh, you know, things like logistic regression and decision trees. And this works in some cases, um, but sometimes the best model for a, a situation is a black box deep learning model. And so to ensure we're getting the most value out of AI in, in our governments, um, I'm a really big advocate of when appropriate using interpretability algorithms like Lime or SHAP um, to make it explainable. And really like these kinds of interpretable approaches are going to be critical if we're to utilize like the full suites of deep learning technologies in government. And that is me, that is our Chai model. Thanks for listening. Um, if you have more questions, um, feel free to reach out. I've got a question from Julian. Are you using entity embeddings for categorical features inside your neural networks? No, we're not. Um, we had initially thought of doing that, then we abandoned it just to time constraints on the project. So it's like a pretty sparse matrix. There's no embedding um, and the dimensionality explodes, right? So like, I think that's something that um, as more data comes in, there's these modules in HIFIS that will allow them to collect more and more data. I think we'll probably have to go down that road eventually. Um, got a question from Ganesh. Uh, what is the dropout rate? So assuming you're talking about like the dropout between the fully connected layer, I think it was 4.45, 4.42. It was, we decided on that after just a big, broad, random hyperparameter search. That was just the best functioning one. Cool. Thank you, Ganesh. Thank you, Matt. Uh, another question from Ganesh. Uh, would like to know about your input data. Uh, like, is it a combination of text and numerical data? Mm, so it is, it is categorical data only um, and some continuous uh, numerical values like heights and weights and age, things like that. Um, no like natural language processing is in this model. The only text data is just the name of different ca categories of multi-value categorical features that are then converted into kind of Boolean matrices. Thank you, sir. Uh, i got a question from Akshay here. Akshay has asked, uh, do these align techniques provide interpretation on row level in data as well? 
So if I'm if I'm interpreting this wrong, then then let me know. Um, essentially, you can do two things with Lime. Lime, the normal out of the box Lime can give you row level or assuming you mean row level, like example level. So per client data, it'll give you the explanations on you know what features are correlating um, for that particular client. Then you, there's also a function in Lime called submodular pick, which allows you to define like find a global surrogate, which essentially kind of in layman's terms, like aggregates and rolls up all of those individual explanations into a global surrogate model. So you can do both in line. Cool. I've uh, got a question from Philip. He says, how do you identify a person? Do you think you have the, the same person with different IDs for your data? So any data set like this, especially um, in this social service application, there is sometimes issues with duplicate data. Um, they have pretty strong like data hygiene and deduplication practices. Um, all the shelters merge their data together. So if someone presents at a shelter, consents to have their data collected um, and provides the same information, then they will, you know, data will be added to the same profile in, in the HIFAS application. So it's, it's really up to like how well that is functioning. We're pretty confident we have a decently deduplicated list. Um, but that's always a challenge with this kind of stuff. Nice one. Julian asks, do you have a baseline performance on more interpretable models for uh, such as tree-based ones, random forest, or XG boost? If so, how does its performance interpretability compare to your neural network? Totally. Um, I would. I can pull up my paper or ask you to go to the paper. We did a random forest and it was, I, I don't want to make up a number. Give me, I can find Either way, like I think uh, logistic regression did the best. It was like within like five percentile. Um, and then the random forest was significantly worse, like 20 percentile lower on the performance metrics we cared about. Uh, we got one from Yang. He said, could you explain in a project like yours, what would be some technique methods and tools to use a prior avoid racial profiling or bias? Totally. Um, so a few, a few things. Lime off, off the hop is one of the ways of doing that. Um, when you build a model and train it, you get your explanations. You start to see what features is the model relying on heavily. Um, and if you start seeing things that don't make sense that are like, uh, I remember early on, we eye color was included in the data set and we trained a model and eye color showed up. It shouldn't show up at all, right? Um, so that is, then we kind of do this iterative feature engineering process where it's like, okay, we're, we're gonna remove those kinds of features from the data set. Um, just because there's the, that real potential for racial profiling bias. Um, and then just in general, seeing is, is there strange statistical biases in the data set, that is just kind of part of the data exploration at the, the front of the project that you gotta do. Um, then I will say in a social service model where you're, you're kind of distributing benefit rather than harm. Like if you think of kind of like, uh, AI in, in the justice world, like that, that's a scary, uh, place to go. Whereas when you're distributing, um, benefit to individuals, sometimes you do want bias. Sometimes there is intended bias. Um, it's similar in a clinical setting. Sometimes certain categories, uh, racial bias, you know, racial bias is not one of them. Um, but sometimes it is useful to have some what would usually be called sensitive features in the data set um, being processed by your model, just because like in a clinical or social service setting, it is actually very impactful um, in understanding that person and helping that person. Um, but it's a it's a sensitive and a gray area. And that's why you need to put things like, I think, explainability in place so that you know what the model's doing. Uh, if the clients do not consent, can they access the shelter? Absolutely. Yeah. So they, you do not need to consent to having your data collected to, to go into the shelter system in London. This is, it's a fully consent driven model. There are some individuals who have no data collected and that is very fine. There's also different levels of consent, how far you want your data shared, how you want it used. Um, consent is extremely important. Um, and the data is very important, but the, the shelter services are more important. <laughs> so yeah. Way to go.